SciBite is produced by JupiterBroadcasting.com, independent entertainment that's on demand and always thoughtful. Check us out. Well, hey there, everyone. You're listening to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science show, which uh, is live on uh, November 1st, actually, and uh, for release on uh, November 2nd. My name is Chris, and joining me, like every single week, is Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hello there, Chris. Welcome back to SciBite. Hey, what are we talking about this week? What do we got on the agenda? This week, we're going to take a look at the space station resupply mission, dinosaurs, Mars, snake oil, asteroids, cryptography, and take a peek at what's up in the sky this week. That's right. You know, really, the way we feel here on SciBite is there's just too much out there that's just plain distraction. Why can't we have our cake and eat it, too, and have a little entertainment and learn about the interesting things that are going on in science, right? That's That's what we're all about. Actually, that's what all Jupiter Broadcasting is all about in all the topics that we cover. But in this one, it's about science. science. Yes. Now, we have a kind of big show today. I was actually, originally, I thought we were actually going to have a short show because so much was in our side bite section, which is sort of our compacted news section. And I thought, mm-hmm. all right, okay. But then I started getting to it, and there's actually a ton of stuff in there. A ton of yeah. stuff in there. So uh, before we get in, because I know once we get tearing through all this stuff, I don't want to really stop us. So I'm going to just get our sponsorship out of the way right up here up front, okay? That's right. Now, uh, a lot of you know, this is my last week of contracting. Next week, I take the big plunge, full-time, jupiterbroadcasting.com. And that does mean sponsorships, but we're trying to pick the really good sponsors, the really good ones. So if you, uh, if you are a fan of audio podcasts like this one is, then you might also find yourself a fan of audiobooks. So last week, I made a pick that was a really, really great book. And this week, I'm making another audible.com book pick. And you have to use the link in our show notes in order for us to get the credit for said book. But this week's book is really awesome. It's it's called The Master Switch, and it's The Rise and Fall of Information Empires. And it's written by Tim Wu, and uh, it's narrated by Mark v- Vector or something like that. It's a great last name. And he is a great, great narrator. And it's about how the internet could eventually be closed down and locked down, even though today it's like this free platform that anyone can broadcast, like us or anyone. Mm-hmm. But everything started like that. You know, radio True. started like that. TV started like that. And everything was transformed. Done. It was a latter-day miracle, reported the magazine. The human voice was speeding from ocean to ocean, stirring the electric waves from one end of the country to the other. The grand finale was a demonstration of Bell's newest and perhaps most astonishing invention yet. A wireless telephone, the ancestor of our mobile phone, you get a you get a ton of great information too about like how the original phone companies were formed and then became oh, wow. monopolies. It is so it's a it's an amazing his, uh, historical like uh, overview, not a complete detail, but overview of the phone companies and then how radio. You know, radio uh, Heather originally started as just people broadcasting out of their backyard. You know, yeah. And telephone originally started by farmers linking to each other over barbed wire, and that's so they could just call each uh-huh. other. And yeah. then, you know, but that all, everything starts like that. And mm-hmm. sort of like how the internet has become just this open platform where anybody can put something on there. But like you start seeing with things like the uh, Protect IP Act and uh, net neutrality or mm-hmm. for or against it and all these other interests that are at play, you could start to see potentially how the internet can be locked down. And this book kind of breaks down how that would actually happen on the internet. Like technically, how could they do it? Oh. But it's not so over the top with the technical details that it'll lose you either. So it's, just, it's, it's a great book, The Master Switch by Tim Wu. Link in the show notes. It is probably one of the books that I would consider. Um, every now and then I read a book and then I carry that book with me for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. This is definitely, this is one of those books because of the way it, you know, gave me so much, so much perspective on things. So I wanted, I wanted to recommend you guys check that out. You'll have to get a link. You have to get the link from our show notes for us to get a credit. If you sign up with an Audible membership plan, I have the gold membership where I get two credits a month, which means two books. We get a pretty good kickback from that. If you just buy the book, we make a percentage too, though. But do Mm -hmm. definitely consider that. And they're also uh, great gifts for anyone you might know who's a commuter or likes to do chores around the house and have a little entertainment. Or, you know, even somebody who wants something to fall asleep to because they have a ton of great books you can just sort of doze off to. And the Audible apps are just fantastic. Nice. 
All right, Heather. All so right. now, with, you know, I start. I know. I know it's a little obnoxious, but really, I the reason why I spend a little time on that, you guys, is because I actually truly, honestly, I believe in that just like I would pretty much believe in anything else we talk about. But with all of that said, it's time to move in to the news. Main engine start, engine, engine turbo pumps at flight speed, and liftoff. There we go. So this is, this is an right. interesting one, huh? This is a refueling rocket? Is that what this is? What's going on here, Heather? Uh, now, people may have heard there was a lot of hubbub about, you know, how the space station may end up, you know, nobody could get there, and, you know, the space well, shuttle didn't they, like, launch, flying. like, a, sh- yeah, well, so we shut down the shuttle, and then we, yeah. then the U.S. contracted with a outside agency to get there, but, like, it blew up on the way or something, right? Uh, the Russian, the, they had the Progress 45. Yeah. Their, their launch vehicle is what they send up the resupply. It's, you know, water and food and equipment and oxygen and all that kind of stuff. So they, they send it up and they had a couple of mishaps <laughs> and this was, yeah, mishaps. That's, that's the nice one. All right. Okay. Um, but this was like the last time, you know, they had to have a resupply ship by a certain time. Because they had a couple of astronauts planning to come back soon. And they're, okay. if they couldn't get another um, Soyuz a little capsule up there to come back down in, then everyone would have to pile in. Because mm. if we don't know for sure when we could get back up there again, we can't just leave people up there. Yeah. No, it could have flown by itself. They don't have, like, even though, the reason I ask you this, Mars, is because <clears throat> this was once in a movie, but they don't have an escape hatch, do they? Uh, well, really, they do. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by escape hatch. I mean, they keep little capsules on there. Shut it's up. It's the Russian capsules that that you know the kind that come and crash land to the. Um, you know, the U.S. always did the splash landing in the water, and the Russians generally did uh, parachutes and then landing on ground. <clears throat> and they always keep it up there so that in the case of an emergency, they have enough capsules that people can climb on board and it may not be the most ideal situation but climbing on board and landing on the earth is a lot safer than should something go wrong on the space station so so essentially it's not ideal to use those so they don't want to have to use them well that's how they come that's how they bring them back oh it is okay i, I thought but they I went mean, up there and got them no they uh well the the when the shuttle was flying they could bring people back uh, they could essentially either send the shuttle up you know with five people when there are seats for seven or, you know, bring two people up and bring two people back. Right. I, see, that's, I think, where I thought that's how they did it. Because I do recall seeing that with the shuttle missions where so-and-so is going up to replace so-and-so on the International Space Station. da 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 yeah. But yeah, that always was they'll, shuttle they'll flights. That. Yeah, and they'll do that. But there also are the Soyuz capsules that can come back down to Earth. What I was referring to is um, maybe you have a Soyuz capsule that's ideally for three people and there's really five on the station. Mm, okay. You know, so... Maybe you figure out a way to get everyone in there. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even in the case of, I think during a couple of emergency um, where there's some piece of satellite or debris that's coming near the space station, it's like if it goes above a certain level, I think they actually go into, go into the Soyuz capsules as sort of a, an emergency location. Mm. Okay. So if there's an emergency decompression at the space station, they can shut themselves in and Right, right. Didn't they do something like that on Mir? When didn't Mir have a leak at one one point, and they had to go into a capsule to? to I, I I can't remember for sure. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me off the top of my head. Mir had did have a lot of various issues. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, so but this is something new. This is the Progress Forty Five rocket that launched on yes. October thirtieth. This is like a whole new endeavor to get up there. Yeah, they. This is this was you know they had another shuttle, oh, another rocket, and they're like, all right, this has got to work. <laughs> They had a couple of failures, catastrophic failures. Nobody was on board any of those. Uh, um, JB Viewer 6 reminds me it was a fire that Mir had that made them do that. Yes. In the chat room. Good catch, JB Viewer 6. But so this had three tons of supplies, you know, food, water, clothing, spare parts, fuel, oxygen, experiments. So. Yeah. Wow, 1,653 pounds of, of, of fuel on this thing, too. That's right, that it was just bringing up to the space station so that it could, you know, it needs to maintain orbit. Um, there's some things, you know, little corrections that it'll have to do. When there's high solar activity, things tend to fall in orbit a lot more. That's, you know, we talked last week about how the 
how the um, the one satellite came down much sooner than expected. It was due to high solar activity. Oh, oh, really? That's what it, that's what the cause was. Oh, okay, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, we just talked about that. Um, now, so the thing that was interesting here is those three tons of of crap they're bringing up to that space station. You yeah, know, like food and and supplies, I guess, right? And, yeah, so there's, you know, scientific equipment, oxygen, food, you know, the, the normal stuff that you'd think is just like everything to survive. Huh. You know, it's like the camping trip that just keeps on going, except <laughs> you can't go out and pick nuts and berries. and yeah. <laughs> so it should be arriving there. We're recording this on the first. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, it, this, this, this episode releases on the second, which is when they're supposed to be arriving there. So if everything That's goes like, as planned. It's, a, it's an unmanned capsule and it should be automatically docking with the space station That's the day this, this episode airs. So do you know uh, they, must, they must still control it from the ground, right? It's not, it's not like a computerized thing, is it? I think it has both. I think it's partially computerized, partially someone watching it at all times. Isn't there something, something kind of unique about uh, this rocket, too? This is the Russians' uh, rocket that they also use for uh, the manned version of the flight, right? Uh, yes, part of it is. is I think the lower stages. So you just have to kind of add a little something to the extra, add the crew compartment instead of this. And then, so it's the, it's the basic same system, which is also why it was another big deal. They, needed to, they need to launch a couple of unmanned launches successfully mm, okay before you know, because they had a couple of these catastrophic failures you need to reprove that all those problems have been fixed yeah that makes sense you know make sure everything is perfectly safe before you start relaunching people up yeah 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 you don't want yeah so you get this under your belt you make sure it's a smooth transition and mm-hmm. then if everything works you apply some of those same that same rocket technology to the version you send people on and then you know we got up there safe with gear yeah. so that's actually yeah, pretty we, efficient. We can, we can put a couple of, of launches up and then we're like, okay, now it's past all the safety regs. Now we can move on to people again. Now the uh, replacement for the shuttle is kind of rocket-like, right? It's sort of, and it's interesting, the Russians yes. never really deviated from that. They just stuck with the rockets, huh? They had their Russian version of the space shuttle. Oh, they shuttle. did? Okay. okay. They, they did. Um, that, you know, we had our plants and then they had plants that looked very suspiciously like it with a just different paint job um <laughs> yeah um, surprise surprise <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> but you know they have their 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 rockets i mean we do have rockets that continue to, to continue to go up we still launch satellites on rockets yeah, we yeah. launch them from florida from alaska from various places you know it's just that while the shuttle was running much flashier the yeah. stuff with people on it is generally flashier. Well, and the fact the way those doors opened up and then stuff could come out, that was always really cool. Yeah. Now, you had kind of touched on this, but if, uh, if this thing blows up and doesn't make it, which it should by the time this comes out, everybody should be like, yay, it made it. But if this, doesn't, yeah. if this didn't work, this would have been the first time in, like, what, 10 years that nobody mm-hmm. had been up on there? And, and wasn't it almost like 10 years to the day that they, that they, they opened... I, I think it was like the end of October, 10 years ago is when... Uh, well, it's not like the people couldn't be there right now. It's just... Yeah. They had to have... The, there a certain group, like I was saying at the start, there was a couple people that were, are planning to come down on one of the Soyuz modules. It's just that if no more supplies got there, then they couldn't leave the other two up there, two or three people up there. So everyone would have to climb into the Soyuz and come down in an emergency. Yeah, I think it's just I, what I, I guess what I was getting at is it's just kind of interesting that this is a problem that they're facing, in a sense, and it's yeah. ten years almost to the day that the that the uh, International Space oh, Station that it opened up. Yeah, at all. It's just to me is interesting that you, you would have hoped that ten years into it, this wouldn't even be an issue anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> things happen, but you know, I would I would love for it to never have come up as an issue, you know. And for a while there, you we were kind of afraid. It was like. Are we going to have to essentially leave the space station unmanned? I mean, we could still fly it remotely, but should anything happen, people make it a lot easier to fix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you can go over and just swoop, you trade out something that you know is broken, or you go out and look at something actually. So this is something that's kind of cool, and you have some follow up links to this in the show notes. But uh, I'm pretty sure that NASA live streamed the launch of this thing. And uh, yes. they also are live streaming the uh, International Space Station's orbit around the Earth. And mm-hmm. one of the things that they caught last week 
was the crazy amazing display that we talked about the uh, Aurora yes. Borealis that they got it from above and yep. oh my god like I didn't realize how far like it kind of projected off the earth as well so I mean they yeah. saw it from like a totally different view it's oh, stunning oh yeah seeing it from there and then I believe they got to see the Aurora Australis as well yeah yeah so you know it just the, the, the height at which it comes up and you see it from the you can get so different perspective from the space station yeah and and they just got some amazing footage of it so you guys can google oh, it yeah. if you want to see that because it, it really was it was so impressive and i would have I, I wish i would have thought of it i wish i would have known to check while it was actually live because I, I don't know not that it really makes that big of a difference but it just seems more epic to ha see it while it happens live uh any other thought any more thoughts on this one uh nothing that pretty much covers it all right so you know what that means it's time to move in to the news bite All right, what story are we going to talk about first in the news bite, Heather? All righty. There is evidence, they have conclusive evidence that dinosaurs migrated. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> what? That is right. You can study the chemical, com the chemical variations in the teeth, fossilized teeth of dinosaurs. Wow. Now, so it's these sauropods, so the giant, you know, apatosaurus, you know, giant long neck, long tail, munching on leafy greens all day and all night. So when an animal drinks water, the oxygen in that water gets incorporated into your bloodstream and eventually ends up in your tooth enamel. Okay. And the water from a mountain stream and the mountain from a lowland swamp have different amounts of various isotopes of oxygen. Isotopes is like a radi radioactive isotopes? Uh, no, it's just there's like Different versions. It'll have some extra neutrons in the nucleus. Okay, so some, but it's something they can specifically measure for. Yeah, it's you can specifically measure for it, and so you can go through and they can measure like almost like the tree rings in a uh, the rings in a tree. You know, they've they can go through and be, and measure. You know, this is what happened in this ring. This is what happened in this ring. Teeth are kind of similar ish. Are these the picture of the teeth that you have here in the show notes? Yes. The, uh, you guys got to go check out the show notes for this episode because <laughs> these dino teeth look like, I don't know what they look like. They're just pretty funny looking. <laughs> They're so, fossilized dinosaur teeth. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So they can count them like the rings in a tree, huh? Yeah, so you can, they can go through and they can, they went through and they isolated various strips and they're like, you know, so they said, you know, this is where these dinosaurs were. This is the kind of plant material that was down here. And it's like, it matched like every so many rings and the rings in the middle had different isotopes, this different type of oxygen. Oh, implying so like, that at some point, like middle in their lifetime, they were that at, a, at a regular interval throughout the, you know, like every year or so they went to a different location for part of the year. Well, it kind of makes sense. Don't they think that also a lot of dinosaurs were cold blooded? So yeah, wouldn't they want to go somewhere where it's warmer, warmer potentially so that way they'd be warmer. Yeah. Or for these, very large plant eating dinosaurs. It was, you know, they're gigantic. How did they get so gigantic? One of the theories is that it kind of was an evolving stage of they didn't get a lot of nutrients from what they ate. So they had to have bigger stomachs to soak in. You know, they have to have, you know, 10 pounds of food for this much nutrients. Right. So that was so a bigger stomach came a bigger creature. And then a bigger creature needed an even bigger stomach and it just explodes. So probably means that they have to eat a lot. The, even uh, if even if they're not even if they're not looking for the climate for themselves, they need to find where there's lots of green. You know, if there's green up in the hills right now, go to the hills. Right. There's right. green down in the valley, you go down to the valley. Exactly. Okay, so it's not really that surprising. No, it's just one of the things where it's it's there's a lot of theories, you know, it's like, you know what, I bet this this makes sense. And now that there's just conclusive scientific evidence they have, you know. Well, have they have, <laughs> yeah, they have these teeth, and they, and they have had these... a dino dentist that has yep. come from Chicago to call him. <laughs> uh, in the chat room, a dino dentist, check him out. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so I mean, that's interesting, I guess. And I remember, remember how I would thought it was just crazy how we were able to uh, determine what was in the water in the uh, in the water clouds in another solar mm-hmm. system. By yep. the, this is kind of like the same thing only here on Earth. Like it's amazing yeah. just knowing how this how how the universe is constructed. And once you understand some of the important principles of that, how mm-hmm. many things you can just figure out by observing how those things have been impacted. Yes. And you can go, huh, well, we know, you know, this type of oxygen is here and forms under these kind of conditions and that type of oxygen is there. And it gives us also information about, you know, water around distant stars or... Did you mention, and I just tuned it out, that you said that this was from the Western United States? Uh, so that's like my neck of the woods. Yes, it is, actually. So there was, dino- there was dinosaurs that were migrating in, in my backyard at one point. Yes, in very parts of the of the U.S. I mean, there are lots of fossil dig sites in the U.S., especially in the West. Hmm. That's pretty neat. You know, certain parts of it are different types. You know, they were underwater, so you have underwater creatures. But. Well, yeah, yeah. So they think maybe underwater creatures would have migrated as well? Well, I don't know. I was just saying there's lots of different creatures. Oh. So I- some parts of the U.S. were underwater during the dinosaurs' time, but others were... Other parts of the U.S., you know, have footprints and bones and fossils. and That was like 6,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So should we move on to uh, Mars and uh, getting the heat from the sun? Not yeah. not you, but I mean actually the yeah. planet. Yeah, this one. Yeah, feeling the sun's wrath. I'm glad you put this one in here because this is, this is a great example of one of those that I saw the headline. Somebody even emailed it in to us and... Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't get a ca- I didn't get a chance to wrap my brain around it, but you have an awesome. I want to give everyone another plug for the show notes. An awesome animated graphic that you scored for the show notes. It oh, really yeah. kind of gives an amazing demonstration of this huge explosion coming off the sun. Oh yeah. And so I guess it, not only are we getting hit with that, and that's why we're getting all those amazing displays, but Mars mm-hmm. is also getting slammed, isn't it? Yeah, this is a different aurora than the one we were talking about last week. They gave us all the reds and okay. The, so it's a different coronal mass ejection. One that didn't hit Earth, it hit Mars. Or just the edge of it hit Mars. I see. On the, the 22nd, it looks like. Yes. Of October. So I, I kind of just, um, I kind of didn't ever, I never thought about the fact that, I, I just thought the sun's explosions would be so massive that it would just go out in like a ring and it would just pretty much rain on all planets that were in kind of that, you know, facing the, the, the yeah. sun. That well, it's type. not like dropping a rock into the water and, you know, the ripples just go everywhere, you know, 360 degrees. It's, you know, these coronal mass ejections are just, you Off know, one side, like in this one. Yeah, just little chunk part of the sun that just kind of spits off yeah. something and it just flies through space. And is there a planet in the way? Well, it'll find out when it gets there. Right, right. So in some cases, uh, it would be possible that it could be multiple planets that get slammed. Yes, it yeah. depends on if the planets, how the planets' uh, orbits line up. So how does it impact Mars when something like this happens? Well, Mars doesn't have the planetary-wide magnetic field like the Earth does. Right. You know, we have you know, the giant magnetic sphere, gives us aurora, protects us from a lot of what the sun's s- sending out. Mm-hmm. But they think early in Mars's development, something big hit it. And when it hit it, it hit, it kind of messed up. We have our magnetic field because we have giant ball of molten iron spinning in the middle of the earth right that's kind of like our that's one of our lucky little uh, happenstances for this planet isn't it yes very much so and something disrupted mars's early in its development and so it didn't have that nice big magnetosphere protecting the whole planet and so you know these coronal mass ejections come out and hit the planet and tear away a bit of its atmosphere And so it loses atmosphere. It's continually even, I mean, this coronal mass ejection hit, you know, Mars. And it has these localized areas where there's still parts of Mars that are slightly magnetic. So it has like these little umbrellas of of a magnetic sphere. And so are those areas known for, uh, can they measure, do those areas have a, 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 a stronger, thicker atmosphere? Um, they're still kind of. They're just small-ish areas. It's not like a perfect, you know, okay. bubble. There's, you know, there is, but it's so enough when, to help So when Mars gets in. hit by something, but yeah, but when the planet gets hit by something like this, then it really, it takes a beating, unlike our planet. Yes. And so 
one of the things I know they were doing is they were, I don't know if they actually caught any, but they're always looking when a coronal mass ejection hits Mars. Do you get tiny little auroras on these little, you know, mini magnetic umbrellas right, scattered right. about? You know, so it's like, watch and see, can you find that? And they, they can tell that what does happen is the, the ejection hits it, you know, and it's like you may have seen, you know, the aurora that hit Earth and it kind of wraps around the Earth, mm-hmm. but it's big enough that it, that it protects us. Now on Mars, it's small enough that it hits the atmosphere. It hits the atmosphere, what it, what's there, and then it hits these small magnetic bubbles. And it, the way it wraps around it, like water rolling around a rock in a river, when it hits the other side and comes together, it's able to kind of rip a little piece of the atmosphere off. And so it's continually losing its atmosphere. And it, does it continually replenish it too? Or is it just getting... Yeah, there is some replenishment. There is water in the... The Martian soil is around the equator. It's anywhere between 5 and 10% water by weight. Mm. So there is water in the soil, deep in the soil. You know, one of the ice caps is water-based. The other one is carbon dioxide. So there is still stuff there that can gasify and send off. And, you know, maybe a comet or an asteroid that has water, you know, hits Mars every once in a while and adds some more water to it to help or help more gases to help replenish the atmosphere. Hmm. Okay. So it's not like it's getting, but it is still getting kind of kicked while it's down, isn't it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's continually getting little kicks while it's it's trying to crawl. I think I'm like, oh, come on, Mars, you can do it because I just want to go there. I want to be able to go there so bad one day, oh, even yeah. if it's not me, even if it's like Dylan's generation. I would just <laughs> love for the and it just seems like if 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 the atmosphere is thin and mm-hmm. you know the planet gets hit with this stronger, then isn't there like if you're a colonist, isn't there a higher risk of radiation exposure, damage mm-hmm. to equipment, you know, essentially yeah. EMP style effects to people that would be early colonizers on the planet. Yeah. I mean, we ha- get that here on earth with the, with the really big coronal mass ejections, you know, and you'll have these big magnetic fields that disrupt satellites or electrical grids. And it's just with the really big ones on earth, it would be a lot more on, on Mars because there's not that big planet wide magnetosphere to protect it. So that's another thing that they look at with the, you know, they have the rovers and the satellites orbiting Mars. So they look at all the equipment they have there that they're still hearing back from. And they watch very carefully about what they do and what happens to them during these kind of events. So there's it's something that you can't really plan for when you, I mean, you shoot off a, a rover like we're going to be doing here in the next, you know, two months. Right. And shoot another rover off to Mars. And you well, can't really cool. predict. I can't know, wait to talk about that on the show. Oh, yeah. You can't really predict when these kind of things are going to happen. No, Only to, you mean in you regards know, to when the sun's going to blow a huge bunch of gas into space? Yeah, you can't yeah. predict it in months and years ahead of time. Right. But when it happens, then you, you stop and you pay attention to what all the equipment's telling you and you try to glean what information you can from that. Oh, absolutely. Learn why you can. And when oh, yeah. ha- So the rovers, the rovers that are going... Will what the one rover is still the one rover? It'll what look up and I mean, what's the new rover going to be able to do? Is it going to? It has a lot more scientific equipment. Um, so like atmosphere the monitoring. Ba- yeah, it has. I don't recall all the various pieces of equipment it has off the top of my head. Um, but all the previous rovers have had solar panels to get their p- power. Uh-huh. This one has a little um, nuclear power source. Oh, really? So it'll able to keep going for a lot longer. You know. For sure, you don't have to worry about dust on solar panels. Are they going to put lasers? Has, They're going to put lasers on it, aren't they? They have lasers. <laughs> Does it have lasers? Yes, it has lasers. What, really? What do they do? It's, it can shoot a laser. Shut and, up, shut up. There's a nuclear-powered... Gasi- ro- oh, my God. Gasify a piece of rock, like, disintegrate it, and then take spectrographic analysis off So all it. they got to do is put Siri on this thing, and then it can talk, and then they send it, and then they put a nuclear reactor in it, and they give it oh, a laser, right. and they send it to Mars. This, uh, uh, I talked about this Jeremy a while back and it doesn't bounce like these others have it's lowered by a, a little tether and has a little rocket pack that's right I remember you guys talking about that oh my god so this is that that this is oh boy this is it's coming, coming full up circle soon. it is coming okay I cannot wait to talk about that all right yes um so uh I guess I but, would... it kind of, but this back to Mars it kind of brings back to really kind of highlighting I mean 
you know, we hear about every once in a while, like, oh, Jupiter's red spot's doing this or that. But I mean, Mars is having stuff done too. I mean, it has dust devils. It has landslides. It has things that we actually see. We have pictures of dust devils. We have pictures of landslides in action. Oh, how adorable. You know, and all this stuff is, is live happening. Yeah, actually, there was a big story about a big, uh, a big uh, landslide on Mars, like a real mm-hmm. picture of a landslide. Yeah. Um, so there is obviously some sort of something at work there. Yeah, there's, there's stuff going on. We can see it. So it's just really interesting that even with the equipment we have now, you know, just the satellites and one rover, we can still see things like ongoing and going on. And, you know, one of the rovers spotted some clouds in the sky in the background one day and everyone went, whoa. Mars has clouds. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess the, you it's it, like, can't take wait, anything for granted, can you? No, and it's kind of interesting because they're like, "Huh, that looks suspiciously like a a cloud." Well, we need more pictures. That uh, I can't wait. Oh man, I am really excited about that because you know, if if, if man can't go, I, I mean, yeah. like, I've loved following what the last two rovers have done. That has been, oh yeah, that has been so awesome. And yeah. now, oh man, I'm excited. I'm excited. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> anything else on this story? No, I think that. Yeah. I think that wraps it up. All right. Well, then let's move on to snake oil. Are you going to try to sell yes. me some snake oil here, Mars? Yes, I couldn't help calling it that. <laughs> they have actually found. Um, well, one. Let's start. Snakes. You know, they don't eat for a while, and they eat big meals. So what happens is when they eat the big meal, they can enlarge their own heart by 40% in two or three days. Gross. Yeah. Um, But there's a certain, they found this certain mix of fatty acids in pythons (laughs) that can spur exercise like boost in heart muscle in the size of mice. Really? So whatever it is that makes their heart grow four times as large might be, uh, you might be able to put it... Or that they can grow by 40%. 40%. So that happens to the mice too? It, yeah, the, lab, the, the mice were able to grow 10% bigger in just oh, a week. Okay. So not as drastic. Yawn. But it wasn't the same type of enlarging heart issue that's, that you see in disease hearts. Oh, it's the kind okay. that you get from, you know, athletic, you know, athletes, you know, grow heart muscle in a different way. So it's like strong heart. Mm -hmm. It's not like suffering heart where it's enlarged because it's been struggling. Yeah, it's not struggling heart. It's strong heart. Interesting. So they've actually found this. It's just kind of, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's like, huh, there's, you know. Potentially a way with either Mm -hmm. a chemical or something to to have your brain instruct your body Mm -hmm. to just increase the size and the strength of something. Yeah. Without the actual regimented exercises that it would actually take to accomplish that same kind of growth. <laughs> so I was thinking more along the lines of people who have weak hearts. Oh yeah, Seized no, for sure. Could actually, you know, take this and make their heart stronger in a good way. Yeah, that's good too. But what I <laughs> <laughs> what what You're I kind of like, I could exercise without exercising? Well, it kind of makes me mad at the brain, to be honest with you. Um if the brain has this effing capability, then, <laughs> Why can't it just do it? Yeah, you know, because it, it should probably be able to do that to all the muscles. In theory, maybe all the muscles. It could be. It, it Mind don't matter. Everyone, stare your arm muscles and think strong. I just I don't understand why if the brain has this capability, it's holding back, and it pisses me off because just like we mentioned last week, how the brain calls itself the brain, it's obviously holding back. It's obviously <laughs> holding back on me, and it. I, I just don't know. You think you think it'd be my buddy in this matter? <laughs> So I got to take drugs in order to trick it into it. But it, so it, it, does it hold that it, they figure if it can happen to, to, to mice, it might be able to happen to other mammals? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the theory is that what if they can. So they're looking at these specific fatty acids and this r- perfect mix of these three. They're like, well, can it do similar things in humans? Can it, you know, trigger the, the heart muscles to actually remember to be strong and, you know, get bigger? And you so, know, it gives also some thought to people who um, you hear this a lot where they're like, uh, yeah, they, you know, when, when it came time to the end, they had made their peace and they were just ready to go. And I think they finally passed. And you always kind of wonder, is like, you hear that. You just hear like people, mm-hmm. th- there is something to that mind over matter. And 
there is something about unlocking those tricks in our own brain to enable us that could be the the biggest boon to medicine. I mean, think about mm-hmm. think about how awesome it is if if somebody with a struggling heart could take some sort of chemical elixir and that yeah. heart begins to self repair and they don't have to do you know transplants mm-hmm. or they don't have to you know live this this horribly reduced lifestyle for the rest of their life um and, and there's no there's no risk of rejection there's no yeah. risk of like um or even know, if it wasn't as good as that could it just because there is a waiting list you right know? But it just so you're on a hard going for a waiting while. list if you could you know extend your time longer yeah. you know keep your heart going that much longer while you're on the waiting list then you know that that would extend your time and increase your chances of finding somewhat something I also find it interesting whenever these kind of things happen is those old, you know, those old remedies that everyone kind of, you know, poked fun at. Oh, yeah, like old wives tell remedies kind of things. Yeah, or, you know, it's like, you know, ancient, you know, you know, acupuncture at one point was, you know, went back thousands of years and these various treatments that go back forever and there's like, yeah, it works. It may be, and then science yeah. goes, ha, huh, and now science goes, um, I totally didn't laugh, but we figured it out. I mean, so I you gotta give us credit for that. Is, you know, and it's just kind of funny when I see that. I was like, that, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's fatty acids in snakes. I wonder if we will find that we can extract these kind of abilities from other animals. You know, there's I, don't, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there must mm-hmm. be other situations where other creatures in nature augment their body. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, there's, there's, there's many. And I wonder yeah. if we could, just like we're doing with the snake, if we could extract those things. I mean, this sounds like this could be a horrible freak show at the same time, but. This I, is a sci-fi movie in the making. Right. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe there becomes like a gold rush on the different type of animals and, and patenting chemically their ability to, to do whatever it is they do. Well, I mean, there's a lot of science out there that's going out there and looking at plants, looking at animals, looking at, looking at nature, looking at fungus and moss from the bottom of the ocean and what's it doing and oh oh, wow it does this can we can we tweak it to do that or for people or for the environment or right right yep well mars i've got good news i've got good news uh our effort here on this snakes uh snake oil story has actually unlocked a whole nother uh science story are you ready for this I'm ready. Oh, here we go. That's my new level up sound. <laughs> oh, that's my looking up sound. Sorry, I didn't mean to play that one. No, here, I'll play my new level up sound. I just got this today. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you like that? All right, so this next one is uh, a story of a molten asteroid. Can you can you tell me what this means? Like, I, I picture, picture like a lava rock in space. Not quite a lava rock in space. As uh, Lutitia. I'm going to say that wrong, but. That's my best guess. Um, yeah. It's an asteroid out there, and they had the European Space Agency Lutea, had the maybe? Rosette. What? Sorry, I was thinking maybe it's Lutea. Lutea? Uh, Sorry, I don't know. Uh, the name of the asteroid, uh, Lutea. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Well, but Sorry. the European Space Agency had the Rosetta spacecraft. It flew within a certain distance of it, and it's one of the bigger ones. It's one. I think it's one of the biggest in the asteroid belt. Hmm. And it flew within 3,000 or so kilometers of it, kind of looked at it, took a whole bunch of images of it, you know, and they see that parts of it are, you know, the surface are, you know, 3.6 billion years old and others are 50 to 80 million years old. So there's a huge difference in age. So it's like the surface and down in cracks. And so it's been around for a really long time. And so they can, they can estimate these kind of things, you know, by the number of craters. Mm, that makes sense. So they can count craters and, be, and they'll say, you know, if there's an average of this many craters per, you know, million years, you know, of this size, of this size, and then kind of count, you know, kind of back calculate what it's doing. Mm-hmm. And so they looked at it and they saw the, the path of the spacecraft itself and in the radio signals that sent back that the gravity was different from what they thought it would be. So it, it worked out it worked out that it would have been it's gonna be the one of the densest known asteroids out there. Mm-hmm. And it was and the density itself suggested that at looking at the size and the craters and the 
the density that was required to be there. They think it's got to be have a significant amount of iron in it. Oh. So oh, they okay. so they think that there's some sort of small semi molten core of iron in the middle of this thing. Wow. So one of the explanations is, you know, maybe, you know, early in the solar system formation that there's a theory that says the asteroid belt was a planet. And something came along and just smashed it to bits, literally. And oh. so maybe this has a piece of that early core. Something that was like part of a fiery explosion. Yeah, right? or it, you know, it, was a, it was a planet forming. And it, the, the forming, imagine the, where the asteroid belt is. It's just all one planet. And so it has a core, it has a molten core to it. And so something so huge comes along, smashes it to bits. That molten core is still there. Mm. So it flies off into space. And maybe one of these asteroids was big enough that it, it cooled around a piece of that molten core such that the center was able to stay, you know, this chunk of iron, maybe a little bit molten, even to this day. Wow. Isn't that what essentially uh, our, w- isn't that, would that be what our core would be hot from is the original formation of the planet? Just getting all smashed together and staying hot like that in the middle? So this is... There is, there is, there is a lot of that, yeah. So this would be, this would be uh, big enough that it, at the middle it could stay hot. So this must be one mm-hmm. huge sucker, right? Yeah, it's... Let's see. Do I have it right here? I didn't oh, of see it. I didn't see it, but I'm guessing it must be pretty huge if it can stay, if, it, if they think that the center could sustain something like that for that long. Because that yeah. must be... I mean, we're talking, this thing's 3.6 billion years old, they think? Yeah. So, could you imagine? <laughs> that's one hell of a fire. Oh, yeah. It was one, something big striking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a big explosion of two giant thing, two planets essentially hitting each other. Yeah. And just, they both lose. So what? So how? So are they? Are they no longer studying? It was just while it was within that close range. It was or? a flyby. Ah, okay. Some of these are, you know, you plot a course and you fly by three or four of these on your way to the outer solar system. You know, and you just kind of fly by and catch all the pictures and the data you can as you fly by it. Hmm. Cool. That makes sense. No, it's just one of those interesting things where they can pull from the signal itself what the gravity is doing. So it's, it's where you can pull more data out of the data itself, sort of hidden data. Yeah, I love that. So, they, so they, they actually can measure the impact of this thing's gravity field on their signal. Yeah, on the, they were able to look at the, the change in path that the satellite had itself, but also in the change of the radio signal. Amazing. Talk about, talk about just getting every nook and cranny of data out of everything. Oh, yeah. Even the transmission that the data comes back on, they get data out of that. Yeah. Should we, uh, should we jump onto this uh, 250-year-old puzzle? Yes. All right, so tell me about this. This is something that came out of uh, USC, right? Yes, it is. It's, there's a lot of, various people have, may have heard of you know, various old ciphers or books that are written in code that they're, you know, they don't know what it's about. They're still trying to decode it. And... Even with all the powerful computers we have now, code breaking still relies on good guesses and insight. Hmm. That's where yes. they get the most of their. Uh, that's where they get the most bang out for buck for, huh? It's just by you people, know the, the the people familiar with the situation making a good guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, the computer can go through and analyze things a lot quicker. Do the the dirty work. You know, it can go through and they can say, "Look at all of the letters." There are a couple of different. They can scan it and they can say, scan all these letters and, you know, group the words together and see if it looks like any specific language. That might, and actually, it'll be say, a, that might actually be a challenge right there because a lot of this stuff they're saying here in the story is handwritten. And yes. so computers can have a challenge just with that aspect. Yeah. And plus there were a number of different types of letters. There were Roman letters. There were symbols that weren't, any, weren't necessarily any specific language. I believe there were Greek letters. So there were various types of letters. They had no idea what language it was. So it's in code in some language that they don't know. And there's three types of things to look, look at. <laughs> so they sort of took this, the, this program and they said, all right, they had it all scanned. 
They said, all right, I think the program is called Night. So they said, scan all the, the, the Roman letters. And it scans them all and it comes back and it's like, yeah, nothing. Hmm. So like, okay. So, it, so they say, scan the, well, maybe the, everyone kept looking at these the Roman letters or the Greek letters and kind of ignoring these symbols. And I went, okay, fine. Look, let's look at the symbols. Oh. Huh. They kind of look like this. Computer, make them do, what if all of these meant this? And so it scans and it says, you know, it looks a little bit like German. They're like, all right, translate, try to, try to break the code if it was German. Really? I was like, a, the computer comes back and it was able to tell the, the, the scientist. It's like, there's a 40% chance that this is German. Ha. Huh. Because you can, it could go through and it could group all the letters. And you can see these types of groups and these type of repeating patterns. And it knows what all various, you know, 80 different languages look like. And it's sort of the pattern that it's following sort of follows German. And so they're like, all right, well. So these are humans secret. making these guesses, these leaps of logics to provide the computer with the data it needs to get to work. Yeah, and so they say, okay, computer, do it as if it's German. And so it comes back, and it actually started decoding right away. Wow. And it was this book of, of a secret society. They were very popular in the 1730s or some 18th century. Right. And so it was this secret societies, and, you know, they have, you know, it was one of these that has strange rituals. and. Oh, interesting. So this is like they coded their rituals and things like that. Yeah. They didn't want people to know. It was know. like the... I think one of the first things that it decoded was, you know, rites of initiation, secret. Wow, really? Yeah, it was like talk about a jackpot was. right out of the gate. Oh yeah, so I was like, oh wow, yeah, that that's what this is. I am fascinated by that, but only only because um, so much of the um, conspiracy circles online mm -hmm. believe that uh, you know that these old some of these old secret societies are still you know at work today and mm -hmm. uh who knows but i what i find fascinating is that humanity really did go through a period of time where mm -hmm. secret societies where were what that what you know real gentlemen got involved in the, the real people that you know were well off or well oh, established yeah. and they were something considered you know very um uh, you know if you were in a secret society you were a figure of high status and whatnot so all yeah. of that is amazing to me and talk about you know you're you you don't know what this thing is for so long maybe you suspect what it is and you start de you start decoding and the first thing you get is some of the juiciest details that's oh, yeah. oh how exciting and you know it's it's more than just decoding for the right just for the pure fun of decoding something a lot of these secret societies had revolutionaries in them and so these revolutionary thinkers you can go back and historians can track they can say wow well when did people start thinking this oh yeah i believe sure. one of the translations from it from this particular text was that i am born from my mother free and not a slave huh so it's it's one of these these ideas that you can go back and you kind of track you know when did these thoughts become popular when were they in among the influential people right what or you know what's even good is like um i would love because you know there's they mentioned in here that uh, there's other there's, it's not just things from germany but there's other things that are coded they haven't been able to get access to you want if some of them would be uh, i don't know why they'd be coded but maybe early scientific discoveries i mean we, yeah what always what always just floors me is when you find out that somebody a long 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 time ago figured out something that we'd only with you know relatively recently had figured out and yes. uh you never know. So, you know, you could find, yeah. you could come across somebody's notebook that would want those kind of secrets to be coded and, and maybe eventually they could unlock that. And that, to me, is always such an amazing insight. Oh, yeah. There's, what was it? I don't recall the name of it off the top of my head, but there is a clock that they found, you know, barnacled up at the bottom of the ocean on a boat. And it calculated seasons. It calculated, like, on a four year cycle, like for Olympics, it'd be like, boom, time for the Olympics. <laughs> you know, and it would it tracked planetary locations and all these different things. And it's like they could just check it through all these gears and we're like, we have no idea who made it. We have no idea how they figured it all out. Wow. We're still trying to figure out what all it does. So there's these these bits and pieces of, of science or of history that we're like, wow, 
what were they doing? How did how did they figure that out? You right. know, right. And yeah. then it was lost for so long. Right. You know, the knowledge is gained and lost. And there's still quite a few of these ancient books or documents that, you know, we're we're still working on decoding. And do you think it's hyperbole to say that that is <clears throat> not necessarily the encrypted hidden stuff, but the whole losing human hu- human thought and dis- and human discoveries? I mean, are we ever going to run into that issue again with the internet, as long as the internet exists? Now, that book I talked about, the the Master Switch, would argue mm-hmm. otherwise. But I mean, you have Wikipedia, you have I mean, all these different things that are are uh, are going to preserve all of our discoveries and our human knowledge forever, as long as they're it's as different. long as the internet's still alive. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot more where things are noted down, but in scientific discovery or in in certain fields, you want to protect, you're on the cutting edge, you want to protect your knowledge. You know, like it's you like, don't want your competitors to know? You don't true? want your competitors to know what's going on until you figured it all out. Sure, sure. So what happens if something happens to you or your notes? You know, what if you only keep, you're, you're really paranoid and you only keep it on this one computer? And right. then you and the computer fall off a bridge. Right, right. Yeah, that wouldn't necessarily be on Wikipedia. <laughs> No, that's not going to be on Wikipedia. <laughs> so there is common knowledge, but there's also these things where it's, you know, one person or one group of people makes a breakthrough, you know, and it's sort of, I mean, you think, you know, hundreds of years down the line or thousands of years down the line, will people really know a specific name of a person? You know, so, how many names of people do we know from thousands of years ago? Oh, from thousands? Oh, sure, yeah. You know, there's only a handful. I mean, there's lots of people that did stuff that I we may not know I can think of a about. few big ones from the last couple hundred years. Well, you know? yeah. But yeah, you're right. From a thousand years ago? Boy, it gets the, the list is probably down to three or four, maybe, at the best. I don't know. Yeah. So, That's I mean, a pretty compelling point. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking way I mean, out. You're thinking yeah, far, thinking, far long term. You know, over the course of centuries or... Or like know, this in this case, of, this stuff was from the 1700s. That yeah. was a long time ago, but that wasn't even a thousand years ago. No. And we were already having this much of a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And it's kind of, it's the, kind of interesting because, you know, there's these, these programs that are artificial intelligence that are, that are working on all these decoding and they still have trouble with translation from one yeah. language to another. I think, you know, I really do think computers are going to help a lot with this. I think that'll make a pretty, a pretty large difference, but mm-hmm. it's not, you're right. That's not the whole solution. It's not going to, it's not going to solve everything. No, I mean, a lot of this cypher stuff is guesses, but the computer can make things go a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in the past, you have to sit there and you have to group all, like, here's where this word appears. You have to write it down. There's where that word appears here. You have to write it down. The computer can do that, uh, the tedium stuff, a lot faster, group everything together for you, and then you can kind of look at it and go, the human brain is still good at seeing patterns. They have a, uh, what is it, like an interview or something, a video in the show notes for this where yes. they, they talk to the guys at the USC who worked on this? Yeah. It's like only they two, talk to them and... It's like three minutes long, so if you guys want to check that out, it kind of has some details in there, too. Yeah. What do you think? Should we move on to the science calendar? Yeah. All right, Mars. Well, uh, here, step into the uh, SciBite time machine. It's uh, time to jump back, because you know what we like to do every week on SciBite. Mm-hmm. We like to go, go back, back in time. time. And we'll find out what happened this week in science. Uh, all right, Mars, let's start with uh, 439 years ago. Tycho's supernova. A supernova was first noted seen throughout through observers throughout Europe and the Far East. For two weeks, it was brighter than any other star in the sky. It was visible in the daytime. Oh, really? Yeah, so we can go back and we see these, you know, ancient, um, or fairly ancient, you know, writings and from Europe and from the Far East about this, suddenly they have drawings of the constellation with an extra star. Oh, really? Yeah, and we're like, huh, that's not a star. Huh. And so then it, over the course of a month, you know, you, they start, you know, then they make notes, you know, it's visible during the day, it's changing colors, and we can go back and we can see that it was, you know, from the notes from that time, we can see that it was visible for about 16 months. It was visible at night, too, do you know? Yes. I, I guess it was it would... visible during the day for at least a, a month or so. Ah, wow. Oh, or, man. let's see, two weeks. At least two weeks to t- uh, two to four weeks. It's visible that, during is, the day. What are the chances of seeing a supernova? They gotta be just astronomical, right? They gotta be astronomical. Yeah. So we're never gonna see yeah. that again, are we? No, we can actually see its remnant, though. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's the that's one of the cool things about looking back at these, you know, these 
these notes that ancient astronomers made. You know, they like suddenly draw an extra star. They're like, whoa, extra star suddenly appeared tonight right here. Bing. And then we go and we look right there and we're like, huh, supernova remnant. Well, I mean, this is from 1572. So talk about, I mean, from our last yeah. story that we just covered, talk about documenting and bringing forward human knowledge. This is a great example, isn't it? Yes. All right. What about, uh, what do you say, uh, we go 116 years ago, 1895, November 8th. X-rays during, were excover- discovered during an experiment at Würzburg University. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, this is probably back before they really knew what they had their hands on, wasn't it? Yeah. It was one of these things where, you know, he's doing experiments with various things. And he's like, huh, I think I saw a glow. You know, the room's just dim enough, you know, it just happens to be the right convergence of stuff. And he's like, did I see a glow? Huh. You know, and there's these stories of, you know, it's, I, I, there's a photographic I, plate over in this drawer and yep, that's the X-rays I was gonna, go through it. And it's like, then you and take it, out the photographic plate and you're like, aw. I think, oh, that, wait, no aw. <laughs> I think that's how they started. That's one of the other ways they started figuring out what it was is they'd put that behind walls and things like that. And they'd still get exposed and they would realize mm-hmm. that it must be passing through the wall and then of course they figured out well if it can pass through the wall it must pass through skin and things like that yeah and um, there's a i've got well maybe not here but you now there's the, the first image of an x-ray you know somebody's hand with a big ring on it yeah yep yep i actually was just reading a story today about um i think it was actually as recently as i don't want to say the 60s but it was actually more recently you would think where they actually in the shoe stores would have mm-hmm. uh they would have they would measure children's feet for sizing and they would put them in an x-ray machine and they had a very famous foot model get uh cancer in in her foot and leg and had to get am- amputated and then they Whoa. also had reports of you know all of the workers just having massive issues with their hands because they'd be in there adjusting the oh. shoe and getting all the exposure and so then they yeah. realized uh, that's actually what ended up triggering the FDA to get into regulating radiological equipment it was because mm-hmm. of this massive scandal. Um, yeah, so, I think you one know, of the... it took us a long time. If you think that, we discovered X-ray 116 years ago. Yeah. And then it was only like 40 or 50 years ago or whatever, how long it was, that we were still screwing it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think one know. of the, you know, one of the lab workers from early, in the early days of X-rays, you know, was doing daily X-rays of himself, just, you know, fiddling oh, around. Boy. Oh, and, boy. And got ill. Oh, boy. Well, well, uh, this has been going on for a long time. Move forward yeah. a little bit. Well, his uh, his sacrifice uh, furthered humanity. Yes. So let's talk about 103 years ago, November 7th, 1908. Professor Ernest Rutherford announced in London that he had isolated a single atom of matter. Oh, boy. And that probably begun a whole process. Holy smokes. Yes. Wow, what a discovery. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's like, wow, 103 years ago, it seems like, Long time ago. And well, but it wasn't even much longer before that, I think, that they didn't even believe the atom existed or something. like. I mean, it was like... The, yeah, I mean, they were still, right about that time, they were still arguing about... Yeah. About the precise nature of atoms and the subatomic and the atomic level of things. Now, we are getting in the range. We may have, I doubt it, but we may have somebody who is alive for this last one. 93 years ago, November 7th, 1918. Rod, uh, Goddard launched his rocket. He demonstrated a tube launch solid propellant rocket. He actually used a music stand as his original launching platform. Oh, neat. The first solid propellant rocket. Huh? How, uh, how cool. Wow. Jeez, 93 years ago. Yep. And a music stand. Hmm. How poetic. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this, one, this one we actually very well could have somebody still listening. I actually know we yep. have some, uh, some people in the uh, retired age range listening and this is uh <laughs> november 7th 1918 93 years oh wait nope 1922 Sorry, 1922 89 years ago yes the entrance to king tutankhamun's tomb was discovered in egypt oh over the course of a very couple of days um it started off with one of uh howard carter's laborers kind of stumbled over a stone step you stub your toe in the desert you're like ow stupid <laughs> rock and you're like wait not stupid rock. Wow. Jeez, that was what a lucky fall. And then over the next couple of days, they, they found some stairs. They, they kind of cleared out 11 steps, exposed part of a sealed doorway. And then they covered it back up. Oh, really? 
Well, they had some, I think they had some big hot shot that was going to come in and then lead. So they kind of had to recover it back up to protect it from the elements mm. until the, the head guy came in and then they could clear out everything and open it up again. And but it was know, 89 years ago this week that they discovered the entrance. And, you know, they figure they want to probably keep that as safe and, and pristine as possible until the expert gets there. All yeah. right. So 71 years ago, something very close to home quite literally happened on Where November you, yes. 7th, yeah, 1940. This one, yes. uh, this one's right in my backyard. Yeah, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. Anyone who takes um, some of the first couple of engineering or physics classes in college probably sees this video. Oh, really? Yep, it is one, it's one of the videos that they like to show because it's, you know, look, you must think about everything. This kind of thing can happen. So what did happen? I mean, I should know. This is my state and it's, you know, I've... So there is, there is the wind was blowing across this bridge. And for a long time, they thought it was just, you know, just simple harmonics. <laughs> like, a, like a vibration? Yeah, like a vibration. But, uh, you know, they thought maybe it just matched. Every structure has like a natural frequency. Yeah, yeah, I've seen this on Mythbusters, actually. I feel stupid for saying that, but I, they actually <laughs> did this thing where they did, like, a vibration myth-busting thing on a bridge. Yeah. And, yeah. So it was this, it was a really weird thing where it's a little more complicated. It's, I think they've decided it's aeroelastic flutter. It essentially means that it caught it just right, that they, when they first put the bridge up, even moderate winds would kind of make it gallop and gertie, yes, as some, the job says in the chat room, where it would kind of wave. But on this particular day when it, when it collapsed, what happened is it started twisting. So the center of the bridge, they've actually got video, and there was two men who walked down the center of the bridge, and they were pretty much safe. Hmm. Well, well, before it collapsed, of course. But it started twisting. And not only that, but the center of the bridge stayed stable. So the two opposite, each side of the bridge started twisting in opposite directions. So that, you know, if you were looking down from one side of the bridge to the other. The near side of you, the left side was twisting down, the right side of the bridge was twisting up. And on oh, the other side, freaky. the opposite was happening. So it was just twisting and tweaking until oh, it man, couldn't I'm, go anymore. I'm it looking at the uh, Wikipedia article of, and yeah. they have a picture of it, and this thing is <laughs> so freaky. Oh, yeah. There's video. There's lots of videos of it. I think I've got, um, there might be a video in the, yeah, there's a video in the show notes for it. And it's just, it had only been open for a few months. Oh, really? But the original bridge had only been open a few months when it collapsed. Oh my gosh, what a massive catastrophe. Yeah, and so I say this, I remember this in my, my first year of physics classes. You know, a lot of the engineers were taking it and the professor pops it up on the screen and said, watch, this is why you have to pay attention in class. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. You have to think about all these different types of things, you know. And so, actually, the collapse of this, there was a similarly built bridge uh, somewhere else in the U.S. I don't recall off the top of my head. And after this bridge collapsed, they went to that bridge and they kind of reinforced it, you know, stiffened up different parts of the bridge to keep from this resonance ha occurring again. Hmm. So they have, uh, they w so they, do they have issues with this with other bridges around the country or did they just build this one bridge like this? It was this particular bridge. It was... Planned in one way, built in another, and then there was a similar bridge built of a similar nature to the same style in a different part, and they they reinforced it first with concrete and then with fiberglass. Um, well, that's that's something, I guess, to keep it from <clears throat> having the, a similar issue. Well, I guess that's something, so it won't ha hopefully happen again, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did anybody die? I don't believe so. I know there is a car in the, the video that they see where it collapsed. I know there's a car in the car on the bridge. I don't believe there, I believe the person was able to get out because it went for a while. Um, huh. And you could actually see, you know, where while the bridge is twisting, there were two men who walked down the center of the bridge to kind of to show that the center was was fairly stable and it was just the the outsides that were twisting up and down. I've seen some comments were, was there a dog in the car? But I know, I don't believe there were any deaths. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right, well, let's go to 54 years ago. This is November 3rd, 1957. 
47 and 64 years ago. Oh, you want to, oh, oh, you're right. I skipped one. All right. So 1947, 64 years ago. The Spruce yes. Goose. Oh, yeah. I don't want to yes. skip this one. The Spruce Goose flew November 2nd, 1947. Howard Hughes and his crazy self piloted his giant wooden airplane. You know, it wasn't actually made of spruce. No, no. It was made of wood. Birch, to be specific, but. Oh, okay. All right. Birch wood. Okay. It, but I think it was the the style of, it was like the laminated wood style, how they made it. I think it was a coined phrase was spruce. Oh, okay. All right. So I think that came. It was one of these things where the military wanted it and it kept taking longer and more expensive and longer and more expensive. And then there were congressional hearings. And he, I get the feeling where it was like, you know what? Pause this hearing. I'm going to go fly my plane. Yeah, you know, I, they kind of cover this scene in that movie, The Aviator. Have you seen that? I haven't yet. Yeah, so uh, he, you know, he ends up getting, uh, Howard Hughes ends up getting pulled up in front of Congress and has to explain, mm-hmm. you know, all the delays and why it isn't here. And, and uh, you know, there becomes a prevailing, the prevailing thought is, well, it's never going to fly. And, yeah. you know, you've, you've hoodwinked us all. And he actually, he actually, it, it, it semi flies. It doesn't like really take off, but he yeah. goes out there and it, it, get, it gets air. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, it flies for, I mean, it had a wingspan of 319 feet. It was 400,000 pounds of flying boat. Yeah, it really was a flying boat. Yeah. But I mean, it, it only flew so high and for so long. I think it took three or four tries before it actually flew. It flew the once and then went into a hangar. Yeah, yeah. And now it's in a museum, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, go, you, can, go, you can actually go tour it yourself. You can go see the spruce goose yourself. 320 foot wingspan. Holy yeah. crap. I mean, geez. What were they going to do with that thing? Make a flying was... restaurant out of it. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was, dur- it was right during the war that they started commissioning it. So it was imagining bigger and bigger and bigger airplanes that could carry more troops, that could carry more stuff to various places. Ah, yeah. I have more troops, more tanks, things like that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, now we'll go to 54 years ago, November 3rd, yes. 1957 for uh, Sputnik 2. Yep. Like uh, the little doggy launched into space. Now, uh, 1952 or 19, the original, 57. What would, uh, the original Sputnik was like 1952 or something like that, right? Um, I believe it was uh, 57. It was just months before. No, really? Okay, okay. Yeah, it was, in fact, um, they hadn't planned on launching Sputnik uh, Sputnik 2 or the one with the dog for another couple months. And the Russian government came to them and said, yeah, you're launching in one month. Do it. Yeah, that's given us a, yeah, they're like, you know, we're getting a lot of great PR out of this because, you know, the U.S. freaked out when Sputnik 1 launched. So guess what? You're going to do something even flashier. You're going to launch a live creature into space and do it in a month. Well, and and uh, they would you you would have neighborhood watches where they would have they people did. out in the streets and stuff trying to you know listen for this thing, listen for it, and all, I mean it was just sending out a beep, but yeah. what was all a what very, was the beep meaning? Very, yeah, yeah, a very freaky beep. <laughs> yeah, and I mean you think about it. I mean nowadays you see something flying in the air like, eh, cool. You're like, yeah. oh, okay, it's a satellite or it's an airplane or, right. But there really wasn't anything then. All right, well, the last one from history is 48 years ago, November 5th, 1963. Yes, 48 years ago, archaeologists found Viking ruins in Newfoundland that predated Columbus by 500 years. All right. So uh, Columbus wasn't the first, was he? Nope. It was kind of interesting. I I didn't realize that it was actually 48 years ago. It was that long ago that they discovered that. For some reason, I had it nearer in my mind in history. Oh. I actually thought it was longer ago, so huh? at least maybe we'll meet somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, uh, boy, that's a ton of stuff that happened. This was a very, very Eventful big... week in history. Yeah, this week had a lot of stuff happen. That's really cool. And uh, all of that stuff with links to everything we talked about, of course, is in the show notes. But uh, what do you say, Mars? You ready to look up into the sky? All right. What's up in the sky this week? All right. Now, in the past week... um. Not that anyone saw it, not as spectacular as, you know, satellites coming down from the sky, but a small comet dove into the sun on the late hours of October 30th. There's actually a little movie that you can see. There's a link in the show notes for that. 
Very now that we have, you know, all these satellites, you know, trained to watch 360 degrees of the sun, we can actually see comets dive into the sun every once in a while. That's just an animated GIF, though. It's not all that interesting, to tell you the truth. It's kind of, it's hard to see. It took me a couple of times to see it. But it uh, is there. You can see the little guy. He goes, doo, 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 boom, and he impacts. Kind of like, kind of like he's trying to, uh, incent- that's kind of gross, but you know what I mean? It kind of does look <laughs> sperm eggy a little bit. Oh, my goodness. Only, like an, only with a sperm, with like with a serious intention to, to get there. I was thinking more Icarus and his wax wings flying too close to the sun. All right, that's fine. And that's evaporating fine. into nothing. Or it could be somebody trying to do the uh, the uh, Star Trek uh, slingshot maneuver, and the sh- yeah, they just didn't quite get it down right. No, yeah, yeah. slight wrong calculation. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, I guess I, I I just thought this was something that happened all the time. I didn't know that was kind of a special uh, special event when that happens. So, well, there it's it seems to be happening. The more the longer we're looking at the sun now, you know, training all these various eyes on it, it happens every once in a while. Yeah, but it's still interesting that we're now able to to see these things happen and. Just a little, in- just a little interesting tidbit. Yeah. All right. All but right. this Wednesday, November the second, is the first quarter moon. Mm. Yeah. On Thursday, if you look to the lower left of the moon in the evening, uh, about two or three fists widths. If you hold your arm, at, your fist at arm's length, go about two or three fists away from the moon to the lower left, and you will see the a bright star. It's called for formal halt. <laughs> Oh. It's got a terrible name. It's Autumn Star. It's the Autumn Star. Oh, okay. It's a random bit of cool. Yeah, cool. And it's also kind of interesting because they can give these kind of degree measurements in fist fist widths because a fist at arm's length is pretty much the same for everybody. Right. <laughs> and it spans because... Well, you're comparing to the moon, little, too. <laughs> no, I mean, like, my tiny little fist held at my arm's length covers the same span of the sky as big football players' fist held at him, his arm's length. Right. Because right. arm's longer. But uh, Jupiter's red spot is going to be crossing the central meridian of it. So you might be able to, if you have a small telescope, you probably will see the great red spot on Friday oh, night. Oh, this, this, the signature storm, right? Yes. And it does, it crosses the meridian fairly often, but there's, you know, a timetable for it, but it's happening this Friday. Yeah, well, hey, I mean, that's our that's our namesake and the show's artwork, um, you know, is yep. all, uh, all that Jupiter stuff. I think that, I think we always, always try to have the storm in the artwork. I think so. Yeah, who knows? All right, and Saturday, the planet Saturn is going to be low in the east, uh, eastern horizon. Looks like a golden star. And there'll be, just to its lower right, there's an actual star called Spica. And it'll, it tends to, I always... I don't know whether it actually does it or if it's just me, but it tends to look like different colors. Mm. It'll kind of look, it'll have like a little red flash or a little blue flash every once in a while. Very cool. Mars is going to be starting to be a morning star in this November. So when, morning star, does that mean like uh, I can see it in the morning or does that mean only when it's dark? Uh, It means it's turning to a morning object, a pre-dawn object. Okay, pre-dawn. So I got to get up early, but all right. If I want to see Mars, yes. I got to get up early. Well, some people have to, you know, start their commute early in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, f- I feel bad for them, but hopefully they get to listen yeah. to SciBite. Yes, hopefully so. <laughs> Our Southern Hemisphere listeners out there will see Mercury and Venus get together in the evening sky later this week. Okay. And early this month, the Torrid Meteor Shower is going to be active. Now, it doesn't really have high peak. It's only about five meteors per hour. Um, maybe some, some bright ones or some, you know, some big slow ones are your Eastern European and Middle Eastern listeners are going to be the most likely to see the best mm. of this. Um, but as soon as the sun is below the horizon, just by a couple degrees, that's going to be your best chance to see anything spectacular than that storm. When uh, Jeremy and I went on our road trip to Cryptic, which was mm-hmm. cool, you know, it was like our last hurrah together before he uh, moved off to his new gig. And mm-hmm. uh, as we were, uh, I think, you know, I think we must have been in Oregon, maybe in the mountains. We were, we were just amazed. You could see like the color of, of whatever it is that you see in the sky. I think it's part of the, I think it's one of the rings of the, of the Milky Way galaxy or something. I mean, it is yeah. unbelievable in a clear sky, which you can see. So some oh, of yeah. these people, I, 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 I just, I think some of these, some of our listeners must be in just some of the most amazing spots to see some of this stuff. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I did a lot of astronomy when I was younger. And I remember going to this one big event. It was out in West Texas in the middle of nowhere. And the first night, I set out my blanket and I just stared up at the sky because I could see so many more stars that I was just like, I must watch this. Yeah, absolutely. Requake myself with the sky. Hi, sky. (laughs) Absolutely. And it was just, it was just so spectacular that I just had to sit there and watch it for a little while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Oh, wait, daylight savings, right? Yeah, I want to remind everybody that daylight savings time for any states or countries that observe that is Sunday morning at 2 a.m. You fall back an hour, you gain an hour. Oh, boy, I got to remember. I got to remember. I got to remember. If I miss a live show, you guys will know why I didn't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, you know, live show, we should mention this show is live. Uh, we right. do it Tuesday evenings, uh, 7.30 Pacific, which I know that's pretty late for a lot of you because we're getting towards the end of the show here now. And so for so for like folks in New York, it's like midnight right now. Yeah. So, and over in uh, over in London, it's uh, four in the morning. Tomorrow. So it's, yeah, it's a little, it's a little rough, but that's good because we release this Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And uh, there's an RSS feed there where you can uh, get the show weekly and all those kind of good stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think, Heather? Is there anything else we should cover before we head out of here for today? Not that I can think of right now. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of SciBite. Like I said, tune in live at jblive.tv on Tuesdays or go grab the episode over on the the main website on Wednesdays. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for listening this week. We'll talk to you next week. And thanks, Heather. Thank you.